It's great to be here. Uh, it's pretty amazing that students care enough about their future uh, to give up a Saturday. It's beautiful outside. I know on occasion I'd prefer to be outside, but thank you for all being here. Uh, it's an important topic. Where are we going to be and what's it going to look like? How do we get there? There are lots of important questions that need to be asked. But when we ask those questions, it's equally as important to know where we came from, how we got here, so we can better plan what the future is going to look like. Uh, you know, just energy can be seen as a pretty boring topic, but as it relates to energy, uh, you know, we all walk in here and we turn the lights on, we have projectors, and we get blinded by big lights and all sorts of things. We take it for granted. Our energy mix in the US is made up predominantly of coal, nuclear. We have the biggest nuclear facility in the US, a little west of here. Hydro, uh, Hoover Dam, for instance, and natural gas. Do you think that's what it's going to be into the future? Or should that be what it is into the future? You know, we can debate all sorts of things. Um, and a lot of the time, we go about it for green reasons, for doing the right thing, as opposed to potentially, uh, you know, what makes the most sense for uh, what the future of the US needs to look like. Uh, if this, thank you. Uh, now, we, as I mentioned a moment ago, the infrastructure here in the US is made up of coal. 40% of our power is generated from coal. Some interesting statistics. They're not meant to scare you. They're just meant to set a stage. Where are we going to go? 75% of our coal-fired facilities in the United States today are either at or beyond their useful life. They're licensed for a certain period of time. Most of them have already passed that. So 30% of the electrons running around in the United States have been generated by resources that are pretty old. And of those, another 10% are actually being turned off in the next two years. So by the end of next year, we're going to lose 4% of our power. What's going to replace it? So it's no longer a conversation of, is it green? Does it have to be sustainable? Are we doing it for all these wonderful reasons? No, we're doing it because we have to. We have to plan for the future. We're given an opportunity today where we can talk about the future. As I mentioned a moment ago, we've got a pretty large nuclear facility just west of us. I mentioned 75% of coal facilities are either at or beyond their useful life. What do you think the number is for nuclear? Has it to guess? Anybody? 100% of nuclear facilities in the United States were permitted to last 30 to 40 years. Palo Verde was built 30 to 40 years ago, and that was the most recent one. So I'm not giving you these numbers again to alarm you, but as much to point out, we've got 60%, because nuclear is 20% of the power in the US, 60% of the power is going to turn off soon. Where are we going to get it from? Are we just going to continue to relicense these things and extend them forever? Probably not the best idea. I'm not saying these sorts of things are going to happen, but we saw what happened in the Gulf, gas explosions in the Northwest, uh, all sorts of things that are a little alarming. Nuclear facilities, Japan. Uh, you know, we have to be aware of what the future is going to look like. Uh, Chernobyl, a little bit before your time, but I'm aging myself. I think I was around at that time. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people died as a result of that uh, explosion and meltdown. And I'm not saying we don't look at those as viable technologies into the future, but they need to be part of a broader mix. They need, you know, we are blessed, as I mentioned earlier, we, we have reliable, we have cost competitive power in the US. We can't trade that. Otherwise, we're not going to be competitive with our neighbours, with other international players. 
So whatever the future looks like, it still has to be cheap. It still has to be reliable. And hopefully, it has to be green. Or at least a good portion of it has to be green. <coughs> and when we talk about green, we're not just talking about no pollution. We heard a wonderful talk earlier about water. Water is an incredibly precious resource. Not many of you probably think about it, but every time you turn your light on, you're using water. 40% of the United States fresh water is used to generate power. We create heat, pass that heat through water, which drives turbines. The steam created drives turbines. Then we have to cool it because it's over a thousand degrees. So we use a lot of water in what we do. We need to rethink the way we do things. Water, as much as pollution, should be high in our minds when we're looking at what we need to do and how we need to plan for it. What's the future going to look like? If I knew, I probably wouldn't be standing here. Uh, I'd be in Vegas, I'd be gambling, you know, whatever the case is. If we had a crystal ball, it'd be great. But at the end of the day, in order for us to maintain the quality of life that we take for granted here, we need to have cost competitive or cheap, affordable, reliable power that is fed to everybody. Everybody walks in and turns their lights on and assumes they're going to turn on. We can't change that. That has to remain, that has to be a constant. But there are technologies out there that provide the comfort and the security we need to be able to live the lives we've become accustomed. What's it going to look like in the future? Is there going to be nuclear? Yes. Is there going to be coal? Yes, but not as much as today. Is there going to be natural gas? A lot more than there is today. It's a lot cleaner burning than other technologies. We are also going to have, though, we're going to have solar. We're going to have wind. We're going to continue to have hydro. And we're going to have solar towers. Some of you may be thinking, what on earth is a solar tower? This is, we have a large tower with a greenhouse around it. Solar energy beats down on the greenhouse. Think of that as plastic or glass. It heats the air beneath it, hot air rises, flows in towards the middle, and up and out the tower. If any of you have ever lit a fire in a fireplace, you know hot air rises. This technology relies on that. If hot air stops rising, okay, we don't generate any power, but we're all stuffed. We float away and, you know, we might as well not be here anymore because we won't be. But this technology generates 200 megawatts of power. What does that mean? Enough for 150,000 households? Pretty significant amount of power. We could build one of these things in the desert, which is going to happen, and feed power into the grid so you can continue to live the lives you take for granted. And when I say take for granted, I don't mean that in a negative way. We're fortunate. A lot of the Western world can't walk in and turn their lights on. Shoot, even in California every now and again, you go turn your lights on and it's black. But we have something that's precious here, and we have to maintain that. And again, the technology is pretty simple. Hot air rises. You flow that air through turbines, which turns a generator and creates electricity. It's something that's pretty sustainable. No water, no pollution, no greenhouse gases, no fossil fuel. It's a great thing. And it's not just a cool idea. It's been built, it's been proven, it's been operated. And guess what? One of them's coming here very soon. We're building one out on the Colorado River, just about 25 miles east of the Colorado, on the way to California. And this technology can actually be a great alternative and replace a good portion of fossil fuel, coal, nucleus, coal gas, etc., in our mix today. Because it actually generates the type of power that's needed. And when I say that, you know, it is uh, cost competitive in that it produces power in a manner that, we, again, we like to see. So I know you're going to go home and you're going to speak to your parents if they're not here 
and they're, you're going to say, you heard about a revolutionary, game-changing energy project. It's green too, Dad, Mum, whoever it is. And their first question is, yeah, but how much does it cost? And you'll be able to turn around and say, no more than we currently pay today, and actually less over time. This thing's cheap. It's reliable. It operates 24 hours a day. How does solar operate 24 hours a day? The ground absorbs heat, radiates that heat, and heats the air. So it'll work at night. So it's incredibly reliable. As I said, it's cheap. Importantly, it's environmentally sound. It's about time we become good stewards of the earth. We talk about environmentalists and conservationists and all those things. At the end of the day, it's only about using what we have in an efficient and sustainable manner. Remove the negativity associated with being an environmentalist or you know, all those things that people throw rocks at. At the end of the day, all we're doing is taking what we were given and treating it as we would want to be treated. The Earth's a pretty amazing thing and we've got to actually stop and pay attention moving forward what it's going to look like. So we need to start planning today for tomorrow. These facilities, as I mentioned, coal and nuclear are about 30 to 40 year life. This has a 75 plus year life. It's going to operate. It's going to be out there. It's going to provide cheap, reliable, green power for all of us. Thank you, TEDx, Phoenix. Thank you all for being here. It's been great.